Hey everyone, Mr. Harvey here. Let's continue our lecture on chapter 5 and today we're going to talk about the Prussians, okay? Again, we've been talking about absolutism. We've been focusing on absolutism in Western Europe. Uh, in the previous lecture we talked about absolutism in Eastern Europe and we met the Austrian Empire that was kind of building uh, out of the HRE. Today I want to talk about Prussia, okay? All right, so ladies and gentlemen, while Austria was focused on molding a strong Catholic state, in uh, more like central and eastern Europe, uh, we are going to see in uh, northern Europe, ladies and gentlemen, um, kind of north, central north uh, Europe, um, Prussia, okay? And Prussia, ladies and gentlemen, is really important because Prussia eventually will be the country that unifies Germany and creates uh, the German Empire. That will be so important. Uh, for us later, all right? So Prussia is emerging. They are Protestant, okay? And they are going to become quite the formidable power in Europe, ladies and gentlemen, okay? And the dynasty that's going to set this up, the family that's going to set this up, ladies and gentlemen, will be the whole uh, Hohenzollern family, okay? The Hohenzollern family, all right? They're going to set up this efficient uh, bureaucracy, set up this kind of militarized state, the, uh, the, Ho the Hohenzollern family is going to be very important. And again, we've talked about some important families in this class, ladies and gentlemen. The Tudors, the Stuarts, the Bourbons, the Valois family, the Habsburgs. The Hohenzollern family is yet another family that is so important for us to know. Let's continue. All right. So Brandenburg was a state uh, and had been ruled by the Hohenzollern family since the early 1400s. Okay. And Prussia was actually... Um, is, is going to arise from this kingdom of Brandenburg. It was essentially a state within the HRE. And remember, there was tons of little, uh, you know, little states, um, you know, little, you know, countries uh, within the, the HRE. Um, uh, and Prussia, ladies and gentlemen, was one of the original electors of uh, the HRE. All right, but this kingdom of Brandenburg is going to give rise to Prussia, all right? So through various, you know, marriages, inheritances, uh, through dip, uh, diplomacy, the Hohenzollern family is going to eventually acquire various territories in northern and central Germany, eventually unite Prussia, and then eventually, later on as we'll talk about in the second semester, unite Germany. Okay, and the person who's really going to facilitate this, kind of set, start this and set this into motion, will be Frederick William the Great Elector. And he is going to help kind of take these territories and start to consolidate them into a unified state, a unified uh, a country that will be known as Prussia. Okay, let's talk about him. So we are going to meet multiple uh, 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 monarchs right now from Prussia. We need to memorize them. We need to know them. And the first is Frederick William, the great elector. All right, so he was a strict Calvinist, but very tolerant. Okay, he was tolerant to Jews and Catholics. Okay, and what he did, ladies and gentlemen, was he started to oversee the rise, uh, the consolidation of Prussia and the rise of Prussian militarism. And we're going to see this be really much a staple of the Prussians. They will have... You know, not the biggest military per se in Europe, but they will be very efficient. They will be very disciplined, and we'll see that. And that will be something we'll see within uh, as a staple within the uh, the German armies, the the uh, the efficiency, um, and the discipline, and the uh, and the tactics and the intelligence. This, this the German army will be very formidable in Europe, and we will definitely discuss that uh, later on. Okay, um, but he used taxation, he used militarism to unify his German holdings into Prussia, diplomacy, um, a variety of tactics to uh, create the, the nation known as Prussia, all right? Um, he taxed uh, his people heavily to help facilitate and build the military. Remember, in order to build you know, an army and military, you need money. Taxation was one of the ways that he did that, okay? Um, and what was really important, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, he needed a strong uh, military power due to some of the aggression, and we've talked about from Louis the Fourteenth tensions uh, between the Poles uh, and the Swedes, and so that was uh, something that really influenced Frederick William in order to build such a strong military with some of these tensions. Now, something that's really important, ladies and gentlemen, um, within Prussia is that the nobility, known as the Junkers, and we need to know that. Let's make sure we highlight that when, it, when Prussian. Um, Prussian nobles are called Junkers, were not exempted from taxes, okay? He taxed them, all right? He taxed them in order to build uh, uh, his military. So that's uh, very important for us, okay? Um, so really important, ladies and gentlemen, is he's going to be collect, uh, collecting taxes from the Junkers uh, with the actual military that they were helping fund. So it was the military that was going out collecting the taxes and that 
taxes was funding the military. Um, but was, what was really important, ladies and gentlemen, and we know this in talking about Eastern Europe, was that the, remember the nobility is quite is, it has uh, you know is quite strong in Eastern Europe, well, stronger than the nobles in the West. And there was a trade off with this. One of the reasons uh, the nobles you know um, accepted the, uh, their taxation and accepted being taxed is well, uh, there was a trade off. Frederick William, and, and, and you know, this is something we've been talking about. Uh, Frederick William gave the Yunkers greater control over the serfs uh, and over the uh, the lower classes. And so, you know, essentially, Frederick William was saying, "Hey, I need your money, but in in, uh, in exchange for this money, I will give you greater control over the serfs." Okay. Um, he pressed his nobles into governmental service. He pressed his um, his nobles into military service. Okay. And uh, this is going to be really important, ladies and gentlemen, because eventually the Yunkers are going to actually be the majority of his military officials, and that's going to help uh, Frederick William, uh, because the government and military officials were to swear uh, an, an oath of loyalty to the government, to the elector, to him. Okay, so he, he is going to have their loyalty because they are, uh, that's part of, you know, a requirement for serving in the government. Okay, so this is Frederick William, the great elector. All right, and there's some important things we're going to, we're going to continue to, uh, to touch on and talk about. All right, the next important leader within the, kind of this rise of Prussia, and I'm just kind of giving some background, some, some, some important leaders within the development of Prussia is Frederick I, the first king of Prussia. Okay, and he earned this title by aiding uh, the Emperor Leopold of the HRE in the War of Spanish Succession. And uh, so the elector of Prussia was now recognized not as an elector anymore, but the king of Prussia. Um, and so essentially what, I'm sorry for switching the slide, let me go back really quickly. Essentially, Frederick, uh, uh, you know, gained that title by lending his army to uh, Emperor Leopold. In exchange for that, he was now recognized as the King of Prussia. Okay. So the next important uh, monarch we, I want to discuss really quickly is Frederick William I. Okay. And we're kind of, uh, you know, a lot of Fredericks here, but let's continue to make sure that we, we know um, these monarchs, and y'all might be like, oh my gosh, just like the Stuarts, James, Charles, Charles, James, yes, a lot of similar names, let's make sure we know them, okay? So Frederick William I, okay, really important, probably one of the most uh, important Hohenzollern uh, regarding the development of Prussia, but also regarding the development of the military, um, it, Frederick William I was very important. He was very Calvinist and also very militaristic, and he is really going to infuse this militaristic culture within Prussian society, uh, and we're and we're going to see you know Prussia start to become kind of known as the Sparta of the North, referring to the ancient Greek state that was very that was you know the society completely revolved around the military. This is going to be a key characteristic of Prussia, and eventually a key characteristic of Germany: the militarism, the discipline. The military is something that is vital and very important to. Prussia, and we will see that translate into importance within the, within Germany. Discipline, this is a very prestigious uh, bureaucracy, a very prestigious part of society, the military, um, and uh, Frederick William will really bring uh, a lot of um, that prestige and discipline and efficiency to, to, um, their, uh, um, to their military, okay? Their society was really rigid and disciplined. It was, it was kind of like a militaristic society because uh, that was what was just expected in their military, and he doubled the size of their army. Now, um, it ha they had arguably the best and most efficient army in Europe. It was the fourth largest, uh, but they, I mean, again, disciplined and efficient. It's in, this is something that we're going to be talking about as we get into some really important wars later, is just because you have the biggest army doesn't mean you have the best army. Equipment, discipline, training, tactics, all right? Um, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit, but this will be a staple of the German Prussian military is uh, their discipline, efficiency, and tactics. Innovative, open to new tactics, open to new ideas, and that really um, is, uh, Frederick William really develops that, um, Frederick William I, okay? And their army was a deterrent. I don't know if you all know what deterrent means, but a deterrent means to really, you know, deter someone from messing with you, deter someone from invading you. Frederick William uh, the first did not necessarily want to engage in conflict. That will be different from uh, Frederick the Great. Um, but Frederick William the first really wanted to say, "Hey, we have this army. We don't necessarily want to use it. All right, but you know, it's a deterrent. Don't mess with us. We have this army. Don't mess with us." Okay, really important. And he's also going to create a very efficient bureaucracy in Europe. He's going to uh, remove 
any local self-governance. It's going to be, you know, Frederick William I is going to have a say in all uh, matters within uh, Prussia. Uh, he's going to heavily tax them, as we talked about before, and he's going to keep the nobles in service uh, for their obedience. Now, remember, he, it's a trade-off. The nobles are going to have a lot of power over their serfs and have a lot of power over um, their subjects, uh, but they will definitely answer to the Prussian monarch. Okay, 100%. All right, perhaps the most famous of these early uh, Prussian um, uh, monarchs is Frederick the Great. Okay, now he, uh, what Frederick uh, the Great had a harsh military training as a child, and that had an effect, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because he wasted no time in using the army. He was very different from Frederick William. Uh, Frederick William, as we just talked about, used the army as a deterrence not Frederick the Great. He is going to definitely use the army uh, when he comes to power, and he's not afraid of unleashing the army. And we see that immediately uh, when he comes to power because he is going to take uh, territory from Maria Theresa after he violates that pragmatic sanction, which we talked about in the previous lecture, and he's going to uh, spark the war of Austrian succession uh, and use his army. Um, so really important, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that Frederick, Frederick uh, the Great uses that army uses he definitely uses that army okay and he's going to force uh, pretty much all of europe to recognize oh i forgot to write europe sorry about that all of europe to recognize prussia as a great power and he's going to earn himself the title uh an admiration of a lot of european rulers just on how um efficient it, the, the prussian military ladies and gentlemen is definitely going to be a military that is um very much admired in in europe and so he's going to earn himself the title of frederick the great now by about seven, uh, 1750, uh, uh, the great European powers uh, will include Austria, Prussia, France, Britain, and Russia, and Prussia will be included within that. Okay, Prussia will be recognized as a part of this balance of power. And um, we are on, one of the things that I'm trying to get at is we're about 100 years, maybe 110, 120 years from Germany unified. And we are seeing slowly Germany is growing up, the German lands, things are changing in Germany, and this is very important. And what we're going to see, ladies and gentlemen, by about 1750, and we'll talk about this more in depth uh, a little bit later on, is that we're going to see some you know, alliances and some rivalries develop, okay? And we're going to see these nations, these great powers of Austria, Prussia, France, Britain, and Russia, form various alliances to maintain a balance of power. The two basic rivalries were this, Prussia versus Austria, kind of... Uh, um, illustrating uh, this uh, rivalry over the Germanic lands. Who was going to be the country to really rule these Germanic lands? Would be Prussia or Austria? Well, eventually it will be Prussia. Prussia will be the one that consolidates and unites the Germanic lands into a German empire. And we had Britain versus uh, versus France, which is, has been a uh, traditional rivalry that we've been see that we've been seeing ever since the Hundred Years' War. Okay, and we'll see these rivalries result into a worldwide conflict, which will be the Seven Years' War, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But the Seven Years' War, I quickly want to uh, just give you a little context to it, is actually you know, uh, considered the first world war. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have multiple fronts all around the world, um, hence the title World War, uh, a world war. Not, it's not World War I, it, it, but it is a world war. Um, and it will be uh, kind of just trying to run back the War of Austrian Succession, it's, but um, We'll talk a little bit more about that later, okay? But a very important war for us to understand, okay? Let's talk about Frederick the Great's uh, accomplishments, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to consolidate, further consolidate power in Prussia. He's going to grow Prussia from a geographic standpoint. He's going to take Silesia and Austria and extend Prussia's territory, all right? He built and used that strong army and really used that army, ladies and gentlemen, to build a strong state. And he forces Europe to recognize that Prussia is legit and here. And it is something to uh, it is something to be recognized and uh, considered, you know, a legitimate power within Europe, right? And he and that was, you know, part of his goals. It was to to have Europe recognize the power of Prussia, all right. Um, now, something also that was really important about Frederick, ladies and gentlemen, is that he was an absolute ruler, but he also lived by a very unique principle, ladies and gentlemen, in that he was the first servant of the state. He ruled under the idea and the and the, uh, the notion that what was most beneficial uh, for Prussia was what he always wanted to do. Very much a politique in that way, ladies and gentlemen. He put Prussia before himself. He considered himself the first servant of the state. So he wanted to always do what was good for his country. Okay, and he expected his people, 
his Yunkers, his military, to have that same idea and same devotion. Very important for Frederick, ladies and gentlemen, the idea of uh, being the first servant of the state. Okay, and he was also an enlightened ruler. We'll talk more about what that means, ladies and gentlemen, in uh, in the Enlightenment. But he was also an enlightened ruler. Now, um, uh, something uh, before I move on to Russia, something quickly that I want to talk about with Frederick, ladies and gentlemen, that he helps institute, and something that's going to be a staple within um, within Prussia is this idea of a meritocracy. Okay, a meritocracy within uh, Frederick the Great's government within Prussia's government we are going to see ladies and gentlemen uh, uh, the way that you get through the bureaucracy the military is not necessarily who you are or how much money you have and this is going to be vital ladies and gentlemen to uh, Prussian society and their military and their government in that uh, the Prussians believed and this is really started with you know the uh, the Hohenzollern monarchs is that they believed that the way you should get be able to get through, through society is based in their gov in their government is through merit, and so this was really important, especially for the Yunkers, because the Yunkers uh, could not get a position of you know power or a position within the military or government unless they had skill or talent or merit. And what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, within this meritocracy that's going to develop is the value on education. And so, if you are a Yunker and you wanted to get into a you know a high position of power within the government military, whatever, you needed to be educated and skilled so you could have the merit to advance. And what's going to be important about this is we're going to see many educated, talented Yunkers, nobles within the military, within their government, and we will see that within um, within uh, their military and that their Yunkers, their, some of their generals are going to be brilliant strategists, brilliant uh, individuals, and that really stems from this meritocracy this idea of advancing through society based on what you can do in your skills rather than your name or your wealth. Uh, that will be a really fundamental staple within Prussia. And we will see that. We will see them have incredible advisors that are talented, incredible military minds that are talented, educated because of that meritocracy. Okay? Um, we will stop here, ladies and gentlemen, and I will discuss the Russians in the next lecture. Very excited. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day.